Hi, everyone. Welcome to Powered by Instinct. I'm Amy Bruski, and I have a special episode for you. I just got done presenting as a part of EOS's Strong and Six campaign. Today, we are focused on using Colby as the easy button for team health. So here are some highlights. Enjoy. What we're going to talk about today is the easy button for team health and using Colby to help you master the people component. So no matter where you are in your journey with EOS, uh, we really know that the people component is so critical. So the people component is really what we're talking about today. We know there's these six key components. And what's interesting about people is that your business can grow. You can be doing everything right. But if the people aren't in the right seats, this is when we've got people who burn out. You, you don't have the sustainability. And it's certainly a lot more painful. So if we can master the people component, all the other components become that much easier. So that's what we're focused on today. And what Colby has found is that there is one factor that is most tied to performance for individuals and for teams. And that's what we're going to uncover today is what is that one factor that if you could focus on this, it's kind of the secret to unlocking the potential of the people in your business. It's going to make your most important relationships easier. It's going to make your own productivity that much easier and um, less stressful. So that's what we're focused on today. So since we have applied EOS to our organization, it's been absolutely a game changer. So we're such, we're such fans and it works so well with what we do. So at Colby, we're on a mission to help change lives. And the way that we do that is we help people understand their own and other people's instinctive strengths so that you can achieve what you care about most. And doing that is something that's universal. So we work with a lot of different types of industries, whether government, whether nonprofit, military, large and small, all the people problems are the same. So here's the deal. Achieving what you care about most can feel like this, the kind of going uphill, the riding a bike uphill. But what we know is you don't have to be moving upwards to move forwards. And that's what we're talking about is moving forward in a way where we're still accomplishing our goals, you're still growing, you are personally getting everything done you need to do, but in a way that's not as painful. So we don't want to slow down our progress when there are some easy ways around this. So Colby is really that easy button for the people component, because you know what? Human behavior, it's complicated. People are not just like you. If they were, as we know, they would load the dishwasher the right way, right? Any of you who can relate to the few things that's like, why doesn't everybody just do it the same way that I do? So people are not just like you, but there is something that we can do to understand the unique differences with people and know how to put that into play to get more done. And by the way, it's not about intelligence. Not, so it's not about hiring the smartest people. It's not about motivation. It's really how people execute and naturally get things done. And that's what we're going to focus on today because it could take you a really long time to figure that out about people, but we have a way to do it where it's going to get you the result that much faster. And kind of our model for our conversation today is what we call the Colby system because Colby is so much more than just an assessment. We do have a baseline assessment we're going to uh, introduce you to today. But it's so much more than that. It is a complete system, and this is our proven process. It is the formula for really the sustainable growth that you want. And the process involves these four steps. So this is what we're going to go through today. It starts with that top right-hand corner and identifying the strengths that you have for yourself and for your team, and then optimizing that. So combining strategically the strengths that you have on board in a way where you get more done. So it's like multiplier effect you can have. And then align. alignment is all about making sure people are in the right seat and that they're actually getting to use their strengths every day. And then ultimately, as you add to the team and expand the team, how can you do that by putting just the right people in the right place and give you some information so that we take the guesswork out of some of that? So that's kind of our, our four-part system. In order to kick us off and get us going, let's jump into identify because this first step is about figuring out what you have on board. So taking inventory of what you have available because we know that we need to start with our strengths and we're going to talk about what happens when you work against that. But I want to give you a model that those of you that are leaders can kind of use as your checklist 
for how well is someone fitting into a role, and that's this three parts of the mind. And it's comprised of the thinking, the feeling, and the doing. All individuals have strengths in all three dimensions of the mind. So where there's unique individuals that have these strengths, and the sweet spot is where all three of these meet and align, is where you are in the zone. You know that feeling where you could do this one thing at work like all day long? It brings you joy. It seems easy and effortless. Those are the things that are aligned with who you are. Now, I'm going to very briefly go through these three dimensions of the mind because I want you to have a good sense of why do these dimensions matter and how do they play in and help you understand when there's something that should be easy for you to do, but you procrastinate it or it's frustrating for you, why might that be happening? So let's start with this thinking part. The thinking part of the mind is more formally called the cognitive. This is about your intelligence. What knowledge do you have? What skills and experience do you have? So think about everything you put on a resume. Those are your strengths in that kind of cognitive domain. And habits go under here too. So all your learned behaviors and habits. To sum it up, this is what you can do, what you're capable of. And it's interesting because I think we're taught really early on in in the educational system that our intelligence is really important and your capabilities are just about everything. And yet there is tons of research that find that just because you can do something doesn't mean you will long-term and do it well. So there's such a focus on who got the best grades and went to the best university or whatever it might be. And yet there is that's not necessarily predictive of long-term success. We know we want to hire people that are capable and smart Um, but if that's all we're focusing on, we're going to have a challenge there. Now, there are lots of assessments out there in the cognitive realm. A lot of them are school-based assessments, but in the workplace, some of you are using either Wonderlic, Predictive Index. If you're in a a certain kind of industry where they use tests, like Series 7 and Financial um, Services, those those are there to help you determine what that is. So, There are other assessments out there that can help you determine skills. But as mentioned, that's just one part of the mind. So this other dimension that we're going to talk about is the feeling or more formally called the affective part of the mind. This is about what motivates you. What do you care about? What are your values? And we know how important core values are. We want to make sure we're bringing people on board that share the values in the organization. Our core values are so critical. We hire and fire to them. All of our annual reviews are based on going back and checking into where is the values fit. This is also your personality traits. Are you more of an introvert? Are you more of an extrovert? Those kinds of things too. Unfortunately, just wanting something isn't enough. And I think we can all relate to setting a New Year's resolution and not following through on that. And we are told that it's because we just don't care enough. We're not motivated enough. And yet there's another piece of this puzzle that is probably more predictive of, are we going to hit some of those resolutions? But this feeling dimension is all about what you want to do. What do you care enough about to take action on? And there are lots of affective or personality tests out there in the workplace. So there is Strengths Finder, Predictive Index, MBTI, Culture Index, Working Genius, all of those that you see on your screen, and so many more. So personality tests are fabulous. We are big fans at Colby uh, about making sure that we really understand someone's personality type and what motivates them, because that helps have some good conversations and understand what do people care about most. But many of those can't be used in hiring. So I just caution all of you, make sure if you want to use something in hiring, it needs to be validated in that way. So this is one piece of the puzzle that helps you understand what is what motivates someone, what do they care enough about to take action on. And then this last part of the mind, this is what we're going to spend all our time on today, everybody. And that is the doing part or the cognitive part of the mind. And this is how you take action if free to be yourself. So we all have these driving instincts or this instinctive need to act in a certain way. These are your strengths in problem solving, in execution, and it can be used very complementary with these other assessments. So I ha- we have a ton of clients who use an affective assessment and Colby together because they're measuring different parts of the mind. 
So the reason the doing part of the mind is so critical is it's kind of this missing piece or this secret that is how people will execute you can tie to test. It is the number one predictor of whether or not someone is going to make it in a role long term. So just because I have the capabilities to execute on something and I want to execute on it doesn't mean that I'm going to do it in a way that needs to be done. And when you start working against what's natural for you, we have challenges long term. And I'm going to show you an activity around that. But we do have the capability as leaders to make sure that people love their jobs. And it's about making sure that we've got that fit in all three. And I'm really going to share with you this doing part or this execution, because frankly, as a leader, it's all about solving problems and getting things done. So I know that I need to understand really how are people naturally wired to do things so that I can make sure they're in the right role with the right tasks. So the Colby A Index, this is kind of our flagship offering. It is what is going to determine this cognitive or instinctive part of how you get things done. It's the only cognitive assessment out there on the market, certainly as far as we know. And the good news about this part of you, this instinctive drive that you have, is it's stable. It doesn't change over time. It absolutely, when we do test, retest studies 10 years, 20 years later, people have the same general results. So on a scale of one to 10, kind of a plus or minus one. And I'm going to show you all the modes here in a minute. It's also predictive. It's very predictive. Where are you going to get frustrated? Where do you, what are you going to do really well? Where are you going to thrive? And it's unbiased. So you can use it in hiring as long as you follow our specific process because we don't find any differences based on gene, gender, age, or race. So again, this is your natural pattern of behavior with one caveat, if free to be yourself. So when free to be yourself and having to exert some level of energy to execute, this is how you would naturally do it. And that's exactly what the questions are asking, asking you. All right, let's look at the possibilities on the results. And I'm just going to go through very, very quickly the four modes. And by the way, since I said this is something about you that's unchanging, think about some of your most important relationships, and maybe it's even your personal relationships, so like a significant other. They're not going to change. So you can kind of let that go. We all need to figure out ways that we can still thrive when we're getting things done, but find that freedom to be ourselves. So here are the four modes. Fact finder. Fact finder is how do you gather and share information? So we all give information. We all get information. And it's this continuum from someone who is going to specify or be very detailed kind of on the bottom of that continuum up to someone who's going to simplify or bottom line things. So think about where you fall naturally in that. I am much closer on a scale of one to 10 to that simplify at a three level, which means I'm naturally going to give the bottom line or summary to things. Can I do things in a more specific way and research and give the details and those kinds of things? Absolutely, I can, I'm capable of it. But the more that I'm in position to do that, it becomes more draining. Um, eventually I'm less effective. So my natural way of doing things is to bottom line things for people. And by the way, here's my opportunity to say that these are strengths. No matter where you fall in this continuum, it is a strength for each individual. So it's just a matter of finding ways to maximize using for that. All right. Follow through is what do you do with organization? So this is how you organize and design or systematize. So when you see the continuum here, See that it's someone who's very adaptable up to someone who's more systematic in a more traditional way. So someone who's going to fall on one end of that continuum systematizing, that's the person who's really naturally going to create systems and plans for your business. And they're going to design the processes that move you forward. They're going to strive to finish one thing before they go on to the next. And someone on the other end of the continuum, someone who's adaptable, that is someone who is naturally going to be juggling multiple things. Maybe, I mean, their best day is when things are not systematic and completely planned out. So when things don't go according to plan, people on that adaptable nature are really going to do their best work. And by the way, here's my opportunity maybe to see, say that we do see trends based on the continuum sum. So if I go back to Fact Finder, Probably not a surprise to all of you that when we look at data, for example, with lawyers or accountants, they're 
closer to that bottom end of the continuum unspecified because their whole job is about being detailed and justifying and doing research and those kinds of things. Other end of that continuum on Simplify, we've got people who are maybe marketing writers. Just think about having to take something very complex and simplifying it down to a simple statement that everyone understands. In follow through, some of our follow throughs on the end of the continuum with their more systematic, those tend to be teachers and pilots. Definitely anything where there is a, a process, you have to do things according to plan. Other end of the continuum, we find salespeople are incredibly adaptable. In other words, if things aren't going to according to plan, when talking to someone, they will adapt and switch gears as needed. So quick start. Quick start is what do you do with risk and uncertainty? And all of us have to deal with change and deal with innovation. Some people very naturally innovate and drive change initiatives. So they're constantly brainstorming new ideas, saying what hasn't been done in the past. Let's just experiment and do it so that end of the continuum where innovation is. These are people that are driving that change naturally. And the more that they can work on deadline, drive with kind of impossible goals, that's when they do their best work. Up at the stabilized end, my goodness, do we need people who stabilize, especially in entrepreneurial businesses when sometimes things are growing and moving so rapidly. The people who are on the stabilized end they're the ones that are making sure that we prevent chaos. So they're saying, hey, let's keep what's working set. Why are we changing everything? Let's make sure that what's working is still being moved forward. So think of it as kind of the people who are protecting the status quo. And we need people on both ends of the continuum in all of these things. And then ultimately, implementer. Implementer is how you get things done in the three-dimensional space or versus more two-dimensional. So that demonstrate under the continuum, they will handle space, tangibles, tools, materials. These are people who are going to demonstrate a solution, build a model, tend to use tools to handcraft a solution. So think of this in, in safety, in people who are Let's say in medicine, I use a lot as an example, someone who's doing hands-on surgery, they're actually using tools to perform medicine. So a surgeon tends to have kind of that end of the continuum. The other people at the other end of the um, continuum in Envision, they don't have to see it to believe it. They're imagining a solution. These are the people who will move forward without having kind of that tangible result. And this is one of those mode that really comes into play when you have businesses like construction, anything to do with hardware versus software. Hardware is going to be on that demonstrate kind of end, whereas software might be up in Envision. So to what degree will you build a solution and need it to be tangible and demonstrate it on that continuum? Now, I have just given you the very quick overview of these continuums. The more detailed look at this is that we use a scale of 1 to 10, and we make sure that everyone sees where they fall on that continuum on this scale. If you have a 7 through 10 in any of these modes, that means that's how you most naturally initiate action, how you move forward, how you get things done, how you will start the problem-solving process. So that's that 7 through 10. Think other end of that continuum that I've been describing, one, twos, and threes will kind of push back against that and counteract or resist acting in that way. And then the one thing I haven't covered at all, see if you have a four, five, and six, and you're kind of in the middle of this continuum, that is what you respond to or react or accommodate. So when you think team kind of setting, we need people who start the problem solving process or initiate. Let's say in Fact Finder, we need someone to gather the data and the information. I need someone at the other end of the continuum who's going to push back when we've gotten too far into the weeds, the one, twos, threes, to simplify and say, hey, gosh, we've gone too far with this. What are the most important points? But we need lots of energy in the middle. We need the four, five, and sixes to kind of bridge the differences on the continuum and accommodate along the way. So Colby goes beyond just an individual assessment, and we look at how does this all play out with the interaction of two or more people in the team, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. So we've got these four modes, we've got these three different zones of operation, and that comes together with these 12 different Colby strips. 
So all of you will fall within one of these 12. And I just want to reinforce, you are capable of, of using any of these 12 strengths. And you do sometimes in your job. But you have four that are most natural for you. And what we find is that the more aligned that you are with those four, that's when you're doing your best work. That's when it's sustainable. And the one thing I will caution all of you on is anytime you're using an assessment, sometimes there is this um, temptation to label people, to put you in a box, to use it as a cop-out. So the guy with his arms like this is like, hey, you know, I don't really do details to the IRS. So therefore, I don't need all my detailed information on my taxes. We all know that doesn't work. So the Colby assessment is not meant to do any of those things. So if you're a leader and maybe you're thinking, this all sounds great, but I need my people to get stuff done and I don't want them using their strengths as an excuse. We are very focused at Colby on making sure that we manage to an end result. So we all agree on what the end result is that we're trying to get and then help people, allow people the freedom to get to that end result that we have all agreed is excellent and what needs to be done, but allow them some freedom in execution so that they can get there in a way that is most natural to them. Eric, I'm about to move forward and optimize, but I want to see what questions we have. Yeah, we actually have a good one. So someone had a question about how Colby and some of the EOS people tools, uh -huh. how they integrate work together. So the, the thought I had was, let's talk about, let's say the accountability chart. How do you use Colby as a part of it? So those of you that are using the EOS tools and having people figure out really where are they in the sweet spot and what do they need to delegate, this is the tool to help you with that because people tend to do it based on traditionally, I'm this role, therefore I should delegate these things. And yet we want to keep the things we do naturally and delegate away or get help on the things that aren't as natural for us because it doesn't have to mean you completely give something up. It means you can get help in certain areas. Okay, I'm just seeing Richard's comment when he first got introduced, he felt like his score was like just slapping a number on you. You know what? I did too. I will tell you the first time I took my Colby index, I said, wait, so you're just telling me these are my four numbers and this is how I operate at all times. And it, it is really not the fact. It's you still have, you know, choice to allocate this energy that you have in ways that make sense to you. What the index is telling you is if free to be yourself, here's how you would act. And that is really powerful because we're not always free to be ourselves. I know that when I look at the 12 strengths, I sometimes have to operate completely against my grain. That's the reality. But what we're trying to say is if we can get dialed into that, we can decide when is it worth my time and when is it not. And we're going to get to that here in a minute. So thank you for that comment. All right, let's talk about optimize everybody because the next part of this Colby system is about making sure that we combine talents and we're maximizing teamwork. And here's the deal. You can't get it all done by yourself. We know that. No one can operate completely independently. And so understanding when do you need to work with someone who's a clone of you versus a complement of you is really critical in this formula. And when I'm working with people who are maybe different than I am, what do I need to know about that? So there's this magic that happens if I get the right combination of talents together for the right reasons. Now, the mistakes that we often make in this area is collaborating all, with too many different people. People tend to clone themselves. Leaders do that all the time. It's like, hey, my way of operating is working for me, so I want a bunch more of me. So I'm going to show you just a couple of things that shows you how we found a formula around this. There's this great quote, though, those of you that Mar know Mark O'Donnell, who's the visionary and CEO of EOS Worldwide, he was on our podcast recently, and I love this quote he had where he said, you know, Colby is the one tool that can make a huge difference because it can have an impact on team health in the least amount of time. So that's our goal is we're trying to figure out how to give you the information you need it might take you years to figure out exactly where someone's in their sweet spot because, frankly, they're capable and they can be getting some of the things done the way you need it. But if you can very quickly get that information, you can then have great conversation, have better communication with a whole team and just give you a shared common language. So that's our goal. And Colby is one of the EOS trust builders. So it does into the 
the EOS process. If some of you are implementing EOS and you haven't gotten to that yet, it is one of the team trust builders. And it's all about team health. That's what we want to make sure that we're focused on. So what does effective collaboration look like? Well, here's my own example, everybody. So I'm the integrator at Colby Corp. I am one of the owners of the company. David is my business partner. He is the visionary. By the way, to make it a little more complicated, we're stepbrother and stepsister. So I know a lot of your family businesses. That's our that's the world we live into. And here's the deal. If you can just, let's just focus on one mode. David is an eight and fact finder. And by the way, he's also a lawyer. So he has a lot of learned behavior around making sure everything is specific and detailed. We need justification for decisions. We make those kinds of things. Well, I'm a three and fact finder. So the best news is we're really good compliments of each other. I will do more of the presenting overviews and simplified things, but then when we start having to do intellectual property and legal things and, and really digging into the specifics and making sure we're on track, he'll step in. So we know based on our visionary integrator relationship, we are uniquely ourselves. So I still, I'm an aid in quick start, which means I do drive change. I have a lot of ideas. So I'm also adding a lot of visionary ideas to this organization, but I get to be the freedom to be myself and not try and be like him. So the diversity of strengths are really important, but guess what? We drive each other crazy sometimes. It's really frustrating to be working with someone who compliments you. We need each other, but there are times when He's talking and my eyes are glazing over and he needs to recognize that. And there's other times where I know I'm going to throw an idea at him and I need to give him the time to digest the information and ask me a lot of questions. So this is not a personality difference, everyone. And I think that's what happens is people take things personally. They see it as personality. But the two of us now know when should we collaborate and when should we split duties? And that came in really handy during the pandemic when all of a sudden we had no learned behavior to help us with what we were doing in our company. And we had to do some pivoting. And it was really easy to say, you do this part, I'll do this part. So we have a very popular tool called the A to A comparison report. It's critical. If you've taken your Colby index, you want to make sure that whoever you're working with really closely, that you that person takes their A and we get an A to A comparison. So we already talked about identifying. Identifying is about making sure we know the strengths you have on their team. And by the way, first step is get Colby A indexes for your team. And then collaboration is about making sure that we understand the people we work with the most and in the whole team itself too. So I've got a little activity for all of you. So those of you that run a team, I'm just going to encourage you to do this maybe at your next uh, meeting. And that is have every go around the room and say, what is one tip that I can give to all of you for working with me? This is a fabulous team activity to just start building that strengths-based culture and how people get used to saying, here's what I need. Your way of taking action is your need. And people give all kinds of responses here, but it is critical that you start that kind of sharing and that people start advocating for themselves and so that you understand why are there some frustrations sometimes. Some people will say, hey, can you give me the agenda ahead of time? Or I'm not going to answer off the top of my head. When you have an idea, can I have some time to just go sit and think about it? Other people say, hey, when I'm stressed, this is what I need, whatever it might be. So what's one tip you can give to others? We all have an operating manual for how we get things done, but you need to give people that manual of how to collaborate with you. So just get the ball rolling. Start having those great conversations in those ways. And then one last thing I just want to show you in this optimized section is that we actually have a formula for success on a team when collaboration is critical. So we have a distribution chart. We will take a whole team of people. Let's say you have eight people on a team. We will plot it out on these 12 strengths and say what percent of your team falls in each of these quadrants. And here's what that does. It will help me anticipate where we do our best work and where we might get stuck. So I'm showing you an example of a team that was a real team we work with. And if you can just look at that fact finder column, you'll see that 69% of this team falls in that seven through 10 range in fact finder and zero people are in the one, two, and three. So I could kind of anticipate that when we're problem solving together, 
we may get stuck in the weeds. And then we've got great solutions for you for what to do with that. So, you know, human nature is that sometimes you want everyone to be like you. But as I mentioned, the diversity is critical. And this helps you see to what degree do we have diversity. Very simple team reports for all of you and a leadership report. So those of you that are leaders, we have a leader report as well to help you with that. Another way of looking at this is that all of our research shows collaborative teams have kind of this distribution, as I mentioned earlier, where we have about 25% of that energy starting the problem solving process or in that seven through 10, about 25% on that other end, kind of pushing back as needed when things go too far, about 50% in the middle. So I can take that, look at this and already anticipate maybe where is it going to work? Where is it not? When do our meetings go on a little too long? When should we work independently and when should we come together? So we are happy to do that with you. Oh, Eric, that section, tell me, do we have any questions? Thank you. There we go. Yeah. So actually I had a couple of people private message me and they're trying to figure out, hey, where do I start? Because all of the stuff you're sounding about is cool. If you have not taken your Colby A yet, you and your senior team take your Colby A indexes. If you've already done that, then you can do the team report and some of the team things that Amy is talking about right now. Yeah. Once you do that, then you're going to go to the next section that actually Amy is going to talk about. Right. And that, and Eric will give you some details on this on the end, but we have, you know, a, a free business account that you can set up so that you can make sure and have everyone take the indexes in the same kind of database and you'll have all your, all your results together. All right, everyone, let's move on to a line. So we've, we know who to collaborate with, anticipate some of our dynamics and how those play out. But we need to make sure that everyone is a position where they're able to be as productive as possible and that we're performing at a high level. So I've got a quick little activity for all of you to do. I'm going to ask you to play along. Some of you may have done this before. It doesn't get that much easier. But here we go. Print your first and last name. Find a piece of paper and print, not cursive, your first and last name. Okay. And as soon as you're done with that, switch hands, right? So if you're left-handed, do your right hand, right-handed left. Directly underneath that, print your first and last name again with your non-dominant hand. Horrible. Nancy said, ouch, slow. Mm -hmm. Just the worst. Yes, like a two-year-old. Exactly. Okay, so here's the deal. What we know about handedness is it's innate to you. Children are born more predisposed right hand, left handed. There's a tiny percent of the population that's truly ambidextrous. But for most of us, we do have a dominant hand. You have innate strengths on getting things done as well. And when you work against what's innate to you, here's what happens. It is slower for you. It is more frustrating. It requires more focus. Didn't all of you feel like, gosh, you really had to concentrate harder? So all of a sudden, it requires more of my mental effort and energy. And ultimately, I get poor results. So I want you to think about how often are you doing this to yourself and trying to force yourself to work against what's natural to you? And maybe how often are you doing this to your team if you are leading a team? Because ultimately, that's what's going to happen. You're going to get poor results. It's going to slow you down. You're going to waste a lot of effort working against that. So with that in mind, here's the deal. We try and change ourselves all the time. And yet, when was the last time you said, I really need to get better at writing with my left hand? We know that we would not do that, but we do that to ourselves all the time. In the, I already mentioned the set New Year's resolutions or whatever else it is. It's, I need to be more this. I want you to start challenging yourself when you have that, those thoughts and say, is that really true for me? Or do I need someone else to do this? Or do I need to find a different way to do this and still get that same end result? Because here's the deal. We talked about how it took more energy to work against your grain. What we know is that we've been told that we need to ask ourselves the question, do I have time to do this task? We're just in the habit. Oh, do I have the time to do this? There's a lot of stuff that will only take you a minute, only take you five minutes. It's not just about time. It's about managing the mental energy you have. So you have this available energy to solve problems, but it is finite. You're going to run out of it. So if you don't allocate that mental energy for the highest and best use of your strengths, 
that's when you're you're ending up wasting it. So there really is this ideal way to use your mental energy. And I want you to start thinking, what deserves my best efforts? Because there's a lot of times that you're pulled in directions and people want a lot of your time and then you don't have really the energy to do other things. So when you think about the kinds of things you put off, you procrastinate, you need to start considering, first of all, by the way, there's something called active procrastination. Some level of procrastination actually works for people. It actually is energizing. But you need to start thinking about what should you be saying no to? And it's not just because I don't have the time. So there's times in your life even that you're going to be saying no to certain activities. And it's not just about time, but you need that mental energy to do other things. Right. So by by the way, those of you that have people in your organization that also have another job or helping a spouse run a business or something, they're using up a lot of mental energy outside of your company and may not have as much left for you. That's just kind of the reality. So success in a role requires you to be deciding what deserves your best effort every day. And by you can't just choose to work longer hours, longer hours. I'm just going to work harder and harder. You start getting diminishing return. And that's about this mental energy. So at Colby, we talk a lot about finding that freedom to be yourself, but we actually have assessments that help you figure some of that out. So we know that we start with the Colby A indexes. That's your strengths. That's who you are. That's the part of you that's unchanging. But we also have a Colby B index that the person in the role can, can take and figure out to what degree do I currently see my job and what do I have to do on a daily basis in my role? So that B is this great analysis where it's, it's a quick assessment. It's 26 questions saying, currently, here's how I see I need to operate in my job in order to be successful. We can then compare who I am if free to be myself with what does my job look like right now. The A is unchanging. We talked about that. But the B is going to change over time because roles change. So it is a snapshot in time, but it helps you predict what kinds of things are maybe frustrating you. And then that Colby C index really makes this all magic because the Colby C is something that anyone in a position to evaluate the role fills out and says, here's how I think this role needs to get done. And so we can compare the B and the C, the job holder's perception, maybe to the leader. Most of the time, a leader is going to do that Colby C. Do we agree on how the job needs to be done? And how does that compare to the person in the role? We are not going to change the person's A, but we can find strategies along the way for what to do with that. Let me give you a really quick little case study. This is someone who was a director of operation, 7463. So no, we're going to pay attention to that blue bar, that follow-through bar. This is someone who's a foreign follow-through, which means they're mildly accommodating to structure and process, but they're much closer to kind of that adaptable range. So this is a person that when we started working with him, he had almost quit his job. The company was going through a lot of change and they kept pushing him to revamp all the processes when going through that change. So look at that Colby B index. It's showing us that. He said, Right now, my job is about initiating system, process, forcing closure, putting things into timelines and sequential. And yet that was, you know, four units apart from where he naturally would have done it. Well, we would have lost this amazing talent who had been a rock star his whole career if we had not understood this piece of it. So then once we finally figured out the struggle and he kept saying, I'm capable of doing this. I've done this before in my career. So he started feeling like he was failing. Of course, he was capable of it, but months of doing that was just burning him out. So the solutions, there are solutions to this, everybody. We pulled in another person, made sure that someone else was helping design the processes with him, his input, his ideas, but someone else was doing it. And then he was able to tweak those systems as needed. So we don't need big radical changes. It doesn't mean someone is absolutely in the wrong seat. There are times when this level of information is so helpful. And by the way, let me just say, there is someone in your company that wants to do the processes. This is actually Nicole from our company. And when the process book came out last year, she was so excited, so excited. We got a picture with the process book and she was just the right person to do it. So people thrive where you struggle. Just know that. I know we feel guilty sometimes delegating or getting help. There is someone in your organization or someone that you still need to hire 
who will love to do those things that you don't do as naturally that you keep feeling guilty about because you should be capable of doing it. So, all right. So leaders, those of you that are leaders, I want to leave you with one final thought in this area. Average leaders play checkers. Great leaders play chess. I love this quote from Marcus Buckingham. And it's basically saying we know that in checkers, every single piece on the game board has the exact same abilities. But the reality is it's really more like chess where you've got to figure out what are the strengths and capabilities of each of those pieces and play chess. So it is our responsibility to figure out right people, right seats. And the great leaders treat this as unique and treats each person as unique and capitalize on those strengths. And here's the biggest danger to all of you guys. What we find is those A players, the absolute rock stars, they will just keep pushing harder. So if they're struggling and they're frustrated, they're just going to keep pushing harder to get the job done until they're burned out. It's shocking when it happens. And oh my gosh, this has worked so well, but we don't see it coming. And that is because they are, they have been so capable. They're just going to keep pushing ahead. So you need some of those objective measures to help you a little bit as the leader. All right, Eric, I just want to see if there are any key questions on alignment and how to figure out who's aligned or any of those pieces before we move on to our very last section. Yeah. So a lot of the questions had an overall theme of, okay, great. So maybe my A and B are different or the A or C are different. Mm -hmm. What do I do about that? Or how can Colby help with? Right. So everyone, we have some really simple solutions and we can walk you through some activities where we kind of get down to the task level and we say, which are the tasks that are the most frustrating? And then figure out what are you going to do with those? Is this something that you need to get help on? Is this help something that you need to actually delegate away? Is this something that you need to make sure you do in a different way? So we have something called conables, which are tips and tricks for working against your grain. We want to minimize how much of the time you're working against your strengths. But when you have to do it, we have some great strategies for that. So we have some reports that have some of those tips, and then we can help you customize that too. All right. Last but not least, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but let me just highlight really quickly. We've done all these things maybe with your team, but then what happens when you're when you're hiring? So you are a growing business. You need to drive your growth and hire just the right people. And it's awesome when you get to start over and get it right. But, you know, there's some challenges along the way. Here's what happens. But we focus too much on skills. We hire someone who's just like you. By the way, you got to have objective measures in place because it's human nature that when you ask questions in an interview, you are looking for someone that would solve problems in a lot of cases just the way that you would. Interviews are hard. It's hard to really get what you need out of an interview. People know exactly what you want to hear. So we got to get really clear on the role requirements and make sure we have some objective measures. And Colby can help you do that. So I'm just really going to highlight this for you. Our process is we start in a very simple way by defining job requirements. Those Colby C's come in handy. So a leader will fill out a C saying, here's what I need out of this role. And then we look at who the leader is, any other team members we need to consider, and we throw that in and we build a basic profile of an ideal candidate. And then you have those candidates fill out Colby A indexes, and we can compare those against the profile that you created and, and rate those for you so that you don't spend a ton of time interviewing people who are not going to come close to getting things done the way you want it done. But it is a really objective process. We're going to define the seat. So those of you, this can absolutely help with defining seats. Colby seats help you with that. And we can also look at people who are already in a role. Like let's say you have salespeople and you take your highest performers. We're going to be able to look at those high performers and see what trends are there so we can define those seats better for you. And then ultimately, we're going to help you go beyond hiring the person. And make sure that you're managing to their strengths. Because the worst thing that you could do is hire someone and then not onboard them based on their strengths and making sure that they're aligned in all three parts of the line. So there are some simple things you can do, making sure that we're capitalizing on that. But ultimately, we need to have each individual make sure that they're taking responsibility for their own careers, their own strengths. And the more you share this information with them, then they become amazing, independent, you know, contributors who are maximizing their own performance 
because they know enough about their strengths. They can anticipate when they're going to get stressed out, what's going to stress them out and get them some strategies for that. So it just gives you this great common language for what's going on. We had a couple of questions about hiring. So we'll do this one at a time. Sure. The first question is, do we have an ideal model or an off the shelf model for, hey, here's what a good CEO, director of operations looks like? Oh, this is our favorite question, you guys. I'm sure you can imagine we get this all the time. We do have some general information on certain job titles and where we see, see trends. We absolutely have that. And even in one of Kathy Colby's books, she has a lot of those charts. Unfortunately, the one hiring guideline that exists in the U.S., Canada, others, but in the EEOC in the U.S., it says we need to establish job relatedness if you're going to use an assessment and hiring. What that basically means is we want to know in your organization with this supervisor, what does success look like? So it is very based on where are you in, in, the, in the growth of your organization? What does this particular leader need? So even, you know, I've seen where five sales managers, there's five territories, and they fill out a cold BC and they all want something different in their territory. And it's because they're one of the territories are brand new and this one's established, whatever it might be. So you do have to still, even if you knew some of that information, you do still have to go through this short little process of at least completing that Colby C and figuring out the compatibility with that leader. So, you know, I had someone say recently, well, we all know an executive assistant needs to be an eight through 10 in follow through. That's not the case. There are a lot of executive assistants where that's going to drive that leader crazy and they need a, they need something different. So I'm going to throw the next question at you is, okay. where do you start with this? Do you start with the natural strengths, i.e. the Colby C, or do you start with the job description? Got it. Okay. You can tell me if you disagree with this answer. It can kind of go either way, but the C helps you write the job description. If you have that Colby C, there's some great information in there, keywords, where then you can use that to attract the right candidates and write the job description. But the job description is a good starting point. You don't need a job description. You just in your head need a clear understanding of here's what success looks like in that role. Yeah. If you have that, then you can do the Colby C, which can then help you write the job description. Yeah. And it helps you guys when you have more than one person do a Colby C where appropriate. So like David Colby and I, if we're going to hire some kind of uh, leader in our organization, we will both fill out the Colby C on that role because that's interesting information. So we both lead the person who's kind of head of finance. If he's expecting something totally different from that person than I am, this gives you that information up front. It's really critical that we don't set someone up for failure by not having that. So we can kind of help you know how many different Colby C's need to be done too. Well, we're going to jump to kind of closing up and then open it up for questions. And the first thing I want to do, I'm going to bring Eric back on here, is that we have a quiz for you. So. You can take it there. Are you a strengths-based leader? Go through some of the components we've been talking about and be really honest and rate yourself on to what degree are you making decisions and allowing people the freedom to be themselves. So it's a free little quiz at colby.com slash EOS. That's a whole landing page too with some of the other things Eric's going to tell you now. Okay, so Eric, let's talk about what else they can do moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked a little bit about it earlier. Right. And so when you're thinking about the steps, the first step is always take the Colby A, right? You need to understand the natural strengths and understand you. For those of you that want a deeper experience beyond what Amy has talked about this morning, we have a, a one day workshop opportunity that's going to really focus on you and unleashing the natural strengths you have locked inside of you, reducing some of that stress. And then most of us are leaders. So we're going to help you understand how do you work well with your team? And how do you bring people into the right organization? Those of you that want to really help the team work together effectively, uh, we have some team workshops for you. It can be as short as 60 minutes up to a full day, depending on how deep you want to go. But that's going to optimize the, the team and really unleash all of your individual strengths. I like to say all of us are amazing at something. None of us are amazing at everything. And so we're going to show you how do you lean on those other people and some of their amazing. And then the last piece, those of you that are charged with changing the entire business and really trying to get everyone going in the right direction as far as their natural strengths, uh, we have our certification course that's going to make you a Colby expert at implementing inside of your business. So you can see that, that trajectory of 
of growth, but it's going to feel really, really easy like Amy showed you when you were riding the bike on a flat ground. All right, everyone, we have gotten to the point where we are ready for some questions. So, so one of the questions someone had was they, they needed a little bit of further clarification between, let's say, one to three, four to six, and seven through 10. And how do you differentiate between those? Wait, so let me make sure I'm understanding. So where you fall in the continuum? Think of as how do you how do you identify the differences or where do you know? Let's say follow through as an example. Mm -hmm. What would you expect from a one to three and follow through versus four to six versus Got a seven it. to ten? Yeah. So start and I know you probably saw that when I was describing some of the the modes. I'm always starting with seven through ten because that's how you start. That's how you kick off your problem solving process most naturally. So as a result of that, that's also where you spend the most time. So if totally free to be yourself, you're going to spend time in this initiating mode. And then the other end of that, that one, twos, and threes is how you resist acting or push back against. So follow through. If I'm in the seven through 10, I'm going to spend a lot of time designing systems, processes. I might start my day with a checklist. I'm going to go back and I'm going to force closure. The one, twos, and threes are the other end of the continuum where they're actually going to push back against anything too structured and they will do things in a more random way. So Eric is, Eric, a two in follow through. Am I right? Three in follow through. Eric's best day is when every single day is different. Like if his day was the same and predictable, that's going to be like not, he's going to do his best work when he's going to start something and then jump to something else and then jump into something else. That actually energizes him, whereas it would frustrate someone else. So that's kind of what we call a counteractor or resistance. Four, five, and six is in the middle. That's where you are going to bridge differences and naturally kind of accommodate the ends of that. So I'm a five and follow through. I'm going to naturally bridge the differences and take a system that's already created and kind of tweak it and adapt it and use it as needed. So sometimes I'm more adaptable, sometimes more initiating. But the biggest difference between those zones is really to what degree do you spend time there naturally? So the higher the number, the more you will spend time there. Hopefully that helps a little bit. So Amy's question is, what do you do with an executive assistant that never follows through? We've talked about it over and over again, essentially. You, does the person, are they capable of doing it? We always want to just ask that question. Are they right enough or smart enough or capable enough to do what you're asking them to do? If the answer is yes, then we need to kind of figure out, is this something that is natural to this person or not, too? So I would absolutely have them take a Colby A and let's just see, you know, is this something where I've seen some great executive assistants, you guys, I had somebody like this that was a fabulous human and I inherited them. And when really digging down into it, they did not fall into the level of structure and process and follow through that I needed them to do. I thought it would be great for me because they tended to really accommodate my crazy quick start, but it's just that natural progression of however you need things done was not there. So the Colby is going to help you figure out, like, do they really get the job and will, is this ever going to change? It may never change. And then ultimately, as you know, too, the want it, do they even want this job is a huge part of that too. But Colby can really help you analyze, does this person just need some strategies for doing their job better or whatever it might be? Or is this never going to change? I think it's going to give you some real clarity on that kind of a thing. It's a big challenge. And I, it's a three parts of the mind checklist. It really is. So really go, go back and do that and figure out where is the gap and can we fix it? Because there's times when you just, when it's, they're not in the right position. So that's the reality. All right. Anything else, Eric? Amy, so you mentioned the three parts of the mind. And I will, a lot of folks earlier mentioned that they use this. Can mm -hmm. you just go like quick, you know, 30 seconds disc versus Colby? Sure. So let's go back. So DISC is absolutely based on, on the Carl Jungian theory of personality. It is definitely a personality test. They call it that. So that has everything to do with your values, your preferences, your desires, what motivates you. And so DISC is really going to tell you, you know, what do you care enough about to take action on? What is predictable about your personality type? If you know DISC, I'm not an expert in DISC, by the way, but I am a high D on DISC. And that, and Eric, you can help fill in the gaps for me. 
you know, meaning that I'm really kind of hard charging and I'm a driver and, you know, there's kind of one dimension to me. You're going to see that play out. But how I do that is very much my Colby result where I'm going to use my aid and quick start in that D area. I know other people who are Ds and they are eights and follow through. So where I'm driving ideas and change and innovation and let's experiment and try it, they are driving follow through and systems and processes and procedures and things. And so it is the same inherit what we will take action on, but how we do it is very unique in our Colby part because that Colby part is the action we take. How we use that driver personality is based on our four Colby numbers. What would you add to that, Eric? In the ideal world, honestly, you would use both because you get to understand different dimensions of a person. So like Amy, I am a high D, so very hard driving. I have somebody that works for me that in DISC is a high I, right? But we have basically the same Colby results. So if, if we're just brainstorming ideas, we're good to go. We're just throwing them out there. But if I come in hard driving, I'm essentially going to run over her. She needs a little bit more of a, at a girl, great job, the things that the high eyes need. So having those two factors makes your job much easier when you're a leader. Yeah. And the key word to the differences on some of these tests sometimes is uh, preferences. So if you take Myers-Briggs, it will ask you, what do you prefer? In other words, what do you want to have happen? And so what you want to have happen may be driving you know, what you're talking about or what you want, but not necessarily what you will do naturally too. So I really think that's a value in an affective assessment. I am, let me pull up the affective words, but I am off the charts on some affective tests when it comes to data and information, but I do not do that naturally. That is not the way, here it is, sorry. That's not the way I take action, but I value it. I want it. So you will hear me saying, what are the numbers behind that? How can we direct the data? I am hoping I don't have to go get all the research, the information, the numbers. I can do it, but that's going to drain me. So that's kind of how do those mix together. I find people get a little more frustrated when what they want and what they do naturally is a little different. That's kind of a disconnect where they, they might try and change themselves a little bit more than others. And I think that was true for me. Getting my Colby result was the most liberating thing for me because I finally realized that I could let that go and I didn't have to be the one to do those things. All right, Amy. So I think we only have time for probably one final question. Okay. Uh, the, the question okay. is, did this work with my kids? Oh, thank you for that question, everybody. We are all our unique selves and it starts at birth. We don't, we absolutely have a index for your kids. It starts at about a fourth grade reading level. It is magic. Honestly, I can't imagine not knowing this about my kids. So let me just bring up for you, there are applications personally for relationships, for parenting. We actually have a parent guide. If your child does a youth assessment, there's actually a parent guide too. So those can all be find, found on Colby.com. But yes, thank you for asking that. Here, here's my advice. Until your child can do the index, really watch their unique way of getting things done. Kids are so much more purely cognitive because we haven't drummed out of them that there's one right way to get things done. So see where you can kind of keep talking about what end result works for you and how they get there. Because honestly, the school system, not great for the kids who are initiating quick start and initiating implementers. Most teachers, we have a lot of data on teachers, everyone, and they tend to be initiating fact finder, initiating follow through. So they kind of like a 7733 three, three pattern is what we see with a lot of teachers. So if your kid is not like that, school gets frustrating for them. But knowing that it's okay and it's their strength. And by the way, the people who are the opposite of that make amazing entrepreneurs. So school is not great for them. And then they get on the workplace and they're just these fabulous performers. And so we need to validate with our kids that they have these unique strengths and help them figure that out. So the kid test is amazing. My children are now much older and they still use that information all the time. I leave you with this one thought, be yourself, everyone else is taken. So I challenge all of us to continue to strive to find your unique strengths and build on that. Instead of trying to change yourself, take those strengths, put them into action and make sure that you're finding your best results with that and your success will come. 
Thanks for checking out this episode of Powered by Instinct. This show is brought to you by Colby Corp, a company that helps leaders and organizations thrive using the only instinctive strengths assessment on the market. If you enjoyed this episode, then follow Powered by Instinct wherever you get your favorite podcasts or join us online at kobe.com slash podcast for all the latest episodes.